Hello, I'm Amanda B. Johnson, and you're watching Dash Detailed. Once in a while, there comes a time to delve deep into a highly technical aspect of the Dash protocol, especially if it's particularly important or unique to Dash. In this case, sporks are both. Now, when I first started researching sporks, I came to learn that they are a pseudo-centralized aspect of Dash, and that, of course, really got my gears grinding. So to find out what exactly it is a spork does, how its benefit could possibly outweigh the risk of its pseudo-centralized nature, and whether there are any plans to phase sporks out, I called founder and lead developer of Dash, Evan Duffield. Here he is. Well, Evan, thanks for joining me. And uh, how are you today? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Nice, I see you have some nice shrubbery or a tree there in the <laughs> background. That's nice, excellent. Uh, yeah, I have a green thumb, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Mm. I'm sure that that is a neat tidbit for anyone else who didn't know that. So Evan, as you know, today I wanted to ask you about sporks because I believe that the first time I ever heard that word used in relation to a cryptocurrency and not like say KFC takeout was in relation to Dash. So is there anything I need to know about first before we get into sporks? Um, okay, so sporks are built on the, the foundation that Bitcoin left us. And basically what, what it uses to to control the network and what a spork uses or what Bitcoin uses. What, you know, what be before we do the foundation, will you just tell me, like in layman's terms, like what is a spork? Like if it's not a plastic spoon <laughs> fork, what is a spork? A uh, spork is somewhere in between a hard fork and a soft fork. Okay. And they're they're controlled by the the network itself. Um, you can think of them kind of like global variables on our network. That, that, that sounds, are that sounds oh. like a lot of programming talk to me. So <laughs> before we get into that, I know you can't help it. Like when you're thinking up in this level and I'm thinking like down in this level, you're like, what words can I possibly use to make you understand? <laughs> so before we get to that, um, let's first lay down some definitions of a hard fork and a soft fork. If I recall correctly, one of them uh, like makes it a, a rule within the protocol, like no longer apply for all former blocks, whereas the other one says, hey, there's a new rule, but it's only for all blocks going forward. Is that the difference between a hard fork and a soft fork? Um, pretty close. So hard forks change the rules at, in, okay. at, at a future time where like if, if let's say you you, you want to change the way blocks are accepted on the network. And it's going to invalidate existing good blocks. Well, you can't do that unless you do it in the future and then you get a, a large majority of the network to update before that's triggered. Um, okay, so a hard fork, in order to change the rules, you have to get a majority to update, otherwise, what, like chaos or something? Um, yeah, they, they use super majorities to, to do it in the, the Bitcoin code, which basically means that you start counting the blocks that are coming out of, of the different implementations. And then mm -hmm. once you get a threshold, then you move from uh, these like softer rules to these hard rules. And then you start rejecting the, the, the blocks that, that don't meet the criteria. Okay, so a hard fork changes the rules at some point in the future and hopefully everyone agrees on them. And now then what's a soft fork? So soft fork just reduces the, um, the amount of blocks that, that will be accepted. They, they tighten the rules, but not in a way that will invalidate blocks. Instead, what, what they do is they rely on the longest chain and so they, they can change rules around a, a little bit with, without causing um, the, the network to have to update in, in this very precise way with, with the hard fork. So there's a little bit more flexibility. So if, if a soft fork in Bitcoin were to be pushed out, for example, if people don't 
have to update to it uh, what, like, if it doesn't make nodes which don't update to it, like, relaying invalid stuff, what would be the reason to update at all to it? Uh, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of incentive other than supporting the network. And ah, supporting the network. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and we're we're back to that again. It it's like herding cats. Once you have thousands of servers and a bunch of implementations running all all together in parallel, it's really difficult to figure out uh, which one should we be running and and trying to keep all of these things updated. So you know, there's there's no really good way of of doing that without. Um, some of the the Dash technology, which addresses those issues um, directly. Okay, so do any other networks use Sporks, or is this a Dash specific thing? Uh, it was invented by Dash. Um, okay. I'm I'm I I don't know if anyone else has adopted them. To my knowledge, um, they're they're not used anywhere else. Okay. So with that foundational uh, knowledge behind us, what then is a spork in Dash? Uh, okay, so the, the sporks in their current implementation, um, it's, it's basically where the developers have a way of, of switching a variable on and off remotely. And so they can say, let's watch the network, and rather than relying on um, counting blocks and and doing these these other more complicated things, we'll just be administrators. And when we see the threshold reached to safely update the network, we we press a button, and then the the network says, "Oh, the developers say it's okay. Let's let's switch from A to B." And okay. so it can be switched off as well. Which with um, with these other types of forks, they're they're simply, once it's turned on, they, they can't be turned off without another update. And so is a spork then a message? Like it's a message that's sent out from the network from developers, or what is it? Yeah, it's a signed message where we, we sign a specific key, very similar to the alert key. And it says, I want to change this specific variable. There's, there's like 12 or 13 spork variables for, for different um, different updates that we've done in the past, and you can switch those on and off with that key. So what kind of variables are we talking about? Are we talking about variables that exist in the client implementation that the, that the person was already running? Or is this a variable within the new version that they are running if they chose to run it at all, assuming that we're talking about these things happening in the case of a new version of Dash being pushed out? Um, so the, it would be a, a new variable if it's a, a new spork. If it's, if it's an older feature, we, we carry those variables forever so you can continually update them. Um, but but we're, we're in the same situation where we need people to update to the newest software so that they, they have the messages to understand um, what the sporks do and what they mean and, and all of that. So then are sporks sometimes used not in the case of like, hey, we're in the process of pushing out version, the next version, are they just sometimes used in an interim time? Uh, they're, they're mainly used for triggering these, these features, like um, they're used to enforce master node payments on the network. Okay. Um, they're they're used to flag whether we would accept the the older version of the masternode software, and we can we can basically do a smooth transitional update using just those two forks, where we give people a time period, like we say between five and nine days of of time. You you have to update. After nine days, we're going to flip it no matter what, right? And so. We, we can create um, these, these much more complicated ways of, of updating, but they're, they're a lot more simplistic for the network operators and for us to, it's kind of like cheating. We figured out a way to, to do the, the hard forks in softworks with uh, about 10% of the code. Okay. 
it's kind of like cheating. All right, <laughs> it sounds like cheating. <laughs> okay, so so let me for for the let's bring it down a bit. So you had just given me some examples of these variables. One of them being whether or not master nodes get paid. Um, what are some of these other variables that you have a private key to turn on or off? Okay, so there there are many different sporks that are supported currently. Um, we have sporks ranging from instant send, enabling it, um, doing block filtering, so that we if if there was uh, an exploit or something that came out that that would continually fork the network based off of this technology, we can trigger that at will, and it would make the network safe to to use during that period of time. This is something you simply can't do with a hard fork or a soft fork because it's it's something that the administrators need to to um, to have some some power over. the The only issue with the sporks is that it's a singular key, and it's it is controlling a decentralized network. And so, what we're doing for that is we have um, a multi sig implementation for for sporking where the the um, the main core DAO has multiple keys, and it would take multiple of us to sign these messages to turn these things on and off. Um, hmm. There's there's also uh, another way of doing it using the Sentinel code, where the master nodes can vote on specific objects, and using their voting power, once they hit a threshold, they can trigger the spork as well. And oh. so. We, we it can sways make, me when you say objects, by the way. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but please continue. Um, there's, there's these governance objects now. Um, some of them are proposals, super blocks, uh, the user profiles. We can make them at will using Sentinel. Oh. Just by making new types and then implementing some rules here and there. And okay. so one of, one of these, these objects could be a spork. And then okay. to enable or disable it, you would you would have the master nodes vote yes or no on it, just like you do a proposal. And then Shoot. that that would implement some code in dash D, and and then we have a perfectly decentralized spork technology. Okay, okay. So you're telling me that in the current version of Dash, these on-off switches that can basically affect the entire network, or rather the entire network who is running the the majority version uh, that con or rather that contains the version that contains the sporking capability. Currently, the ability to flip these switches on and off resides with a few members of the core team who have the keys to a multi-sig address. But you're saying that it when Sentinel is implemented in I don't I don't know 12.1 or later, you'll tell me that in a moment, I'm sure, that it will move from being like a, this is something that, for example, only Holger, Evan, and Ryan can activate to something that is rather voted upon by all the master nodes. Is that correct? Precisely. Um, current wow. Evan, this is what I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> because when I heard of Sporks and when I, like, I, I asked someone on like a Slack chat one day, I was like, what are sporks and how do they work? And when they told me, like basically what you told me, I was like, wow, that 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 sounds like something that like can and or not even can, I'm but should be like decentralized eventually, right? And you're telling me that this is possible and that this is going to happen. I mean, really, what what we've been doing over the past three years is implementing the um, the, the features that we want and need to run the network with the least amount of effort possible. Because we have limited resources, we have limited volunteers, we, we just, we don't have a lot of time, and, and we, we want the, the network to, to function the, the way that we envision it. And so, to implement the, the way that I'm describing to you, it's at least 20 times the work. But, I mean, to, to get there from here, we, we have a clear path now, and we only expose the network to the centralized risk just for a little while, while, mm -hmm. while we actually use the functionality, prove that it worked before implementing the, the way, way harder uh, version of it. Okay. And so I, I think that's the best of both worlds, really. Okay, so 
with this, as you say, centralized risk having been implemented and in use for some time now, what are the benefits of it that have made the centralized risk acceptable? Um, whenever we've updated the network, um, for example, in the 12.0 release, we use sporks to do it. The, the issue with hard forks is that you have to um, bind them to uh, blockchain-based variables. And we simply don't have a blockchain for the masternode network which leaves us in an odd position because we have to be able to enforce masternode payments. If, if, the, if we need masternodes stored in the blockchain, and that's, that's also going to be really difficult to, to achieve in the eventual. What um, do you mean masternodes stored in the blockchain? What, what does that even mean? Oh, okay, so when, when you're getting the masternode list of, of all of these available masternodes on the network, um, two peers could have different lists and the, they might be one or two off. And I mean, this is, this has been something that has, that that's happened with our network for since the, the very beginning. And we've, we've flushed out most of those changes. What but, are the lists used for? What, like why would my client compile a list of masternodes? They're used for payments. So that's, oh. that's how we calculate the payment queue. Okay. All right, and if there's two lists on two different machines that are one off, it means that payment queue is gonna skip that, that one that's different depending on um, which machine you're on. And that's and gonna make an unhappy masternode user, it, owner. It's gonna make a fork is what it's gonna do because oh. once, once you enforce who gets paid, they have to agree all of the time. Oh. Which that, that's how, um, blockchain technology would fix it because you have a immutable record of who's been paid and uh, who should get paid next. But Oh, okay. We, so if two different clients are making two different payments, then it creates a fork because the record of past payments is now different. Um, correct. But there's, there's a one, one little thing that that's a little bit off. It's, um, the, the difference in payments is caused by one of the two peers not knowing about a specific masternode. Okay. And we can get around this with a spork. Um, we, can, we can utilize some of, some of this technology so that we can um, turn off the payment enforcement for a period of time to allow the network to update all of these thousands of masternodes and then once they're all updated on the, the new software, we re-enable it, um, payment enforcement turns back on, and then we're golden again. So the people who hold the private keys for this multi-sig address that can flick on or flick off spork variables, I mean, like, during these times when there's like an upgrade being pushed and there needs to be a monitoring of masternode payments or whatever, are the people who hold the keys like, like, like drinking espresso all through the night and <laughs> watching the network twenty four seven, or like what's the process of even monitoring these times? Um, yeah, so I, I tend to live out of cafes when I'm when I'm working and doing the updates. So yeah, there's there's a lot of espresso going on. <laughs> it sounds and, like it. And then once, uh, but it, it's it's actually a lot easier than that. There's there's some commands you can use to figure out um, how on the same page the network is about who's supposed to get paid. There's, there's a, a command that will show you which masternodes are being voted for to get paid, and it'll tell you if there's two masternodes with about the same amount of support. And when you, when you see that, then you, you know that the network is still in a state of updating. Once it, now tell me about this. Okay, these, this terminology, this terminology you've just used of masternodes getting voted for to get paid. Maybe I was under the wrong impression. I thought that masternode payments were determined by like randomness from the hashes of miners. Is that actually not how they're paid, or is it masternode quorums? Paint me the picture. I think I don't know. Ah, uh, you're. Okay, it's both, both are, are true, actually. Uh, both, okay. 
so what, what happens is there's this deterministic algorithm and it'll go through all of the older master node payments. It'll calculate um, who should be paid next based off of the history, right? And then it's looking at the existing master node list if if it sees, you know, master node X, master node Y, or master node Z hasn't been paid in the past few thousand blocks, and it looks like it's the next one using the deterministic algorithm to get paid, then if it's in a quorum for, for that specific block, then it'll vote on that specific master node. And what kind of quorum is this? Is this an instance end quorum, or what kind of quorum is this? Uh, they're all the same, really. They, they all use the same technology. The, the quorums are basically where you, you take the proof of work hash from, the, from a specific block and then you compare it to the, the master node hashes using this algorithm to calculate the distance between the numbers. And then based so off of that, you make decisions. So then there are payment quorums. So if the if the algorithm checks the current or if the algorithm is looking through all of the master nodes, identifies the ones which have not been paid for X thousand number of blocks, if that particular master node is currently within the payment quorum of that block, that's when and why it gets paid. Um, very, very close. Uh, the, the master node that's getting paid is outside of the quorum. Oh. So he, he's one of 4,000 master nodes that could possibly be getting paid. There's a quorum of voters and they're, they're a subset of the master nodes. There's 10 of them per block. And okay. it's those, those 10 votes that determine who gets paid. Um, the, Got it. What I, what I was talking about earlier when I was saying that there could be differences of who gets paid on each block, what I, what I mean is like if there's 10 masternodes voting on a specific block and six of them say X should get paid and four of them say Y should get paid, um, we haven't reached consensus yet. And that's when, um, when we reach consensus is when the sport gets turned on. Now, why would you? Oh, you mean okay, got it. That's that's when the spork says okay, it's okay to do payments now because now consensus is being reached. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And to be clear, I don't even. I was gonna. I, I wanted to make a clarifying point for anyone who is perhaps on the even less technical end than me, if that's even possible. That when Evan says votes, um, he's he's not meaning like masternode votes that people do manually where they're like voting for treasury proposals, like yes or no, this thing should be funded, but rather these are like automatic votes that the masternode software is doing itself, not that like a human is doing at their keyboard. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> not that, I don't even think that any like non-technical person or a person who doesn't aspire to be technical will even watch the episode this far, but just in case. <laughs> All right, so then, this decentralization of the sporking function um, that you've mentioned in that it, it will be put into the hands of masternode votes. What, what version is that? Is that 12.1 is that that's being tested now or is that still down the road? Um, so 12.1 is the, the foundation for all of this. It's okay. essentially the administration software for our DAO. It's going to allow us to, to build these, these systems that, that secure the network in a much more decentralized way. Um, like, like I was saying earlier with the objects, we can make objects at will that do really complicated things. Uh, and, and they do it outside of the dash D, C++. And then we, we actually just use these, these sentinel voting mechanisms to trigger things to happen in dash D. So we, we've, We've um, isolated the the business technology, or I mean the the business flow and the the business software from the the network software, which is Dash D, and we we've moved that into a higher level language, which is Python. And then by using by using this Python and updating after after twelve point one is released, we can start making features. 
um, for sporks and for um, building evolution user accounts and, and things like that. All right, so I think I have pretty much just like one or two uh, wrap up questions for you. Uh, basically, I unfortunately, because of a time zone miscalculation, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm just crap with time zones sometimes. Um, so I missed the the Q3 core team report call in which I'm quite certain you all gave a status update as to 12.1 and its testing. Since I missed that, and for anyone else who may not be caught up with that either, um, what is the status update? Uh, sure. Okay. So with 12.1, uh, the, the best way to explain it, this is our pivot from basically an operation that was ran out of a garage for a while. I, I was the sole full-time developer. I wrote all of the original software. And then we got 12.0 and we basically raised about a million dollars, which we've, we've gotten like a nice team. We have a, a really solid programming team now of about 20 people between the evolution team and the Dash D team. And we've we've shifted off the the way that we we do work to a, a much more um, classical way, uh, similar to how other organizations have have modeled themselves to to operate. And we're we're moving over over to this um, during during twelve dot dot one. Twelve dot one is also going to be what is administrating this organization. The network has literally all of the power over everything that happens still. But we, we need software to run um, for this process. We need, we need to be able to have milestones and we need to be able to release payments for these proposals. Like uh, what if we want three milestones for a project that takes a year and we say we want X, Y, Z for each of those milestones. And then you, you have someone like the project managers voting on releasing the milestones in releasing the funds associated with the milestones. These are the types of things that, that we're going to be utilizing based off of this technology. The most recent thing that happened is uh, we hired Tim and uh, a few other people who have taken over the main development on Dash D. And they're, they're doing really good work. They've uh, been working on, on the testnet implementation and have found some issues with uh, Sybil attack on testnet, fix that using a new proof of um, service implementation called Watchdog. And uh, these, these are the, the last changes before we start testing super blocks on 12.1. On and that's literally the last thing we need to launch. So we're, we're pretty close. Uh, we just want to make sure that we don't damage the network in any way when when we update. We're we're not in a huge hurry. We we're like really well positioned, and we just uh, want to be careful with you know a seventy million dollar network. Mm -hmm. That's a nice thing to be able to say. Like, I feel like we're really well positioned. <laughs> okay, so so then so this watchdog thing is still sampling something something to yet be implemented into what's being into what's being tested into 12.1 I guess I didn't know that if something was being tested it could be updated like even within the testing uh, yeah so watchdog is fully implemented we're running it on testnet currently and oh. um, it's it's working uh, it it found all of the the nodes that didn't update and has flagged them so we can we can issue the the command to update the network and fork off the old clients using a spork again, same same technology. Um, and we're we're testing this because this is going to be the exact same thing that happens on mainnet. The purpose of Watchdog is to prove that Sentinel is running. Basically, it Watchdog is another object, so this is another uh, governance object type, and it it allows Sentinel to vote per masternode and say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm watching this object and I see that I need to vote on it. And if you don't vote on it, you get flagged. If you get flagged, you get removed from, from the payment queues and from the masternode list. So it's, it's the proof that the whole thing is operational on, on the masternode. And am I 
does that mean uh, all master notes will have to vote on everything henceforth, or did I just totally construe something that's not there? Oh, so um, Sentinel uses automation for a lot of this. Um, it, it runs in the background every couple minutes. And so the master node software, oh. it like looks, sees there's a watchdog object, pulls it in, looks at the rules associated within Sentinel, sees that it needs to vote on it, votes, and then dash D on the other side knows how to deal with that and, and will flag and alter the list and, and all of that good stuff. I see. So this being, again, the difference between like manual human voting and like automated mm -hmm. software voting. Yeah, I think we need different terms or something. It's kind of getting confusing. I do too. I'm <laughs> going to think on that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, as a final question, um, la la la. Oh, yes. So um, as a final question, and actually, had I made the call, um, had I made the, the core team report call instead of uh, messing up the time of it, what I wanted to ask is, um, is there a shortage of testers? Um, yeah, we could actually use a, a lot more testers. We, we've had the, the really hardcore testers come in, and those have been wonderful. But um, I, I think it's time to actually start uh, doing some more thorough testing of, of just making sure all the, the functionality works. So if, if anyone is interested, um, we could throw up a link to, the, to that, uh, that forum post. OK, well, before I'm going to do that, I'm going to ask you point blank, where is the Treasury proposal to incentivize testers? Well, that would be a good idea as well. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Because I've got to say, Evan, like within the Dash ecosystem, it seems to me that incentives are aligned properly, just left, right, and center, which it actually was the First reason I started looking into Dash to begin with, I was like, oh, there are people who understand incentives, which act which is in complete like scarcity within the crypto sphere, if you ask me. But this one particular thing that like testers are expected to volunteer just seems like an anomaly. Like someone definitely overlooked paying testers. Yeah. Yeah, um that that sounds like a, a pretty good idea. Um I think maybe we could give away like a few dollars worth of Dash. I, I don't even think it needs to be a ton of money, but I'm totally willing to pay people for their time. And I, I believe that's actually what makes Dash successful and just different than everything else. Yeah. Well, think on that, Evan. Just, just think on that a bit, if I might encourage you to do so. Uh, will do. Because I would be interested to test uh, if there were a bit of compensation and just a like a, a, a guide that someone like myself could follow to be like, oh, this is what I do, then this is what I do, and then this is how I know I'm done. I, I would like to contribute. That's a good idea, too. So we, we could make a, a testing guide that, that just directs you through it, shows you which buttons to click and, and all of that? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> OK, excellent. All right. Well, uh, with that, I will thank you for your time. And as always, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> OK, bye, Evan. Bye. Howdy, friend. Pete here. I'm the behind the scenes guy at Dash Detail. And you may know me as the manservant. I had an idea for a future episode and wanted your help. The episode is to be titled Ask ABJ, ABJ being Amanda B. Johnson. And I just thought it'd be fun and interesting to hear what questions you had for her uh, about Dash or cryptocurrency. So please take a moment if you have any questions and let me know at trustthyself at riseup.net and she'll answer them in a future episode. So again, trust thyself at riseup.net. Look forward to hearing your questions and until next week, take care, peace.